Well, good morning, everyone. We are so happy you are here. For those of you that are live, it's me. I'm here in the back. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we are so happy to have live worship again. If you're worshiping with us at home, and, and by the way, if you're if you're live and, I, and I'm referencing the middle there, that's where all the people at home are sitting. So, <laughs> uh, but if you're watching at home, we got just a ton of new technology that we're trying out today. Hopefully, everything is going to go off without a hitch. But just in case it doesn't bear with us, we're, we're doing our best to get it going. So, uh, but we have people here at church for the first time since last November, and I'm thrilled about that. We have live music for the first time since a year ago, five days ago. <laughs> so, the, the, a year ago, five days ago was the last time we had live music in this church. So, I am just really, really excited. Um, I only have one other announcement for us today, and that is, in order to get things up and running, we did have to purchase a, some new equipment, and if you wanted to give towards that, that, would, that was above and beyond what we were expecting this year, and so if, if you wanted to be generous and give toward that, we would love it if you would. Just put in the memo of your check, it's going to tech upgrades or reopening, we'll figure out where it's going. If you give online, just give us a call and let us know. I think that's all that I have today, so 
Uh, I should probably pray, right? Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for us. Thank you so much for a morning where we could come together, where we could worship you, worship you with friends, worship you with others. God, worship as a community. God, for all of us that are here, for all of us that are at home, thank you. And we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. I get to ask you to stand and sing with us. Woohoo! It's not time. 
Go ahead and have a seat. I'm Julie Haberichter, and um, I've had the privilege the last couple of years to be involved with kids' ministry, and I love middle and high schoolers, but I've also been with the little ones. So today, one, I'm so excited to be back in Real Church, and you guys sounded amazing, even through masks. <laughs> Um, but I also wanted to challenge the adults because I found when I was working with the younger kids that even though these lessons are simplified, they are also the same lessons that, you know, we're learning from Pastor Kel. And so don't just check out and say, oh, this is the kids' video. It's, they're all really fun. And, um, and there's some really easy lessons to learn. So today... Um, well, last week, our elementary students started the month of March with a bake-off challenge, learning about what it means to have patience. So if I decided right now that I wanted some cookies, I'd have to take the time to get all the ingredients, measure and mix them together, put them on the trays, and then bake and cool them before I could eat one. That's a long time to wait for something that I want right now. Today, we have a really amazing story from the Bible that also talks about patience. We're going back to the Old Testament to check in with our friends, the Israelites. You may remember that for hundreds of years, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Did you catch that? Hundreds of years. God then sent a man named Moses to lead them. And through Moses, God rescued his people and set them free. Every day, God was with them. He even did miracles for them, including providing food and water. But that doesn't mean the Israelites actually listened and did what they should have. Instead, they chose their own way and had to face the consequences. Let's take a look and see how things turned out. Until then, it's Bible story time with Kellen. Yes! Hey guys, cool robots. Did you build those? No. no. Okay. We really didn't have the patience for it, so uh, our friend Mishka built them for us. What have you got for us today? I have something fun, and it's all about patience. Perfect. Take it away. The Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt for many years, until God chose a man named Moses to help lead them to freedom. For the first time in their lives, the Israelite people were free, and they were waiting to go to their new home. This story is all about what happened while they waited. And we're going to tell this story with Laundry Theater. <laughs> Moses climbed up Mount Sinai to talk to God, leaving the people alone at the bottom of the mountain. While Moses was up on the mountain, God gave him 10 commandments and told him a bunch of other things he wanted his people to do. And it took a long time. Moses had put his brother Aaron in charge while he was gone. <laughs> Moses was taking too long and the people started to get worried. So they gathered around Aaron and said, make us a God that will lead us. <laughs> Aaron told them to bring him all their gold, and that's what they did. Aaron melted the gold together into the shape of a calf, or a baby cow. Then he said, Israel, here is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the mountain, God told Moses what the people were up to, and God was not happy. Moses came down the mountain carrying the Ten Commandments on two stone tablets. As Moses approached the camp, he saw the golden calf. He saw the people dancing and worshiping it. He was very angry. Moses threw the tablets on the ground and they broke into pieces. He took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. 
Then Moses ground the calf into a powder, scattered it all over the water, and made the people drink it. The end. What a story. The ending is a little dark. That's true. But impatience has consequences, right? As soon as the Israelites had to wait on God, they turned their backs on him. They forgot what they knew was true. They forgot how God loved them so very much and had rescued them from slavery. They forgot about the miracles and how God had provided for them. You know, I, I think I forget about what God can do sometimes when I'm impatient. Oh, oh, me too. Hey, we all do. When things are tough and they're taking way too long to get better, it's like we forget everything we know about God. We should be consistently reminding ourselves of how good and how powerful God really is. Wow, good stuff. And thank you, Kellen. You're welcome. I'll see you guys later. If only the Israelites had remembered what's true about God, that they could trust him no matter what. He would never, ever have left them. If only they had focused on those things. The story could have had a much better ending. I hope today we are reminded that it's always better to trust God and be patient. God is loving and faithful and always there to guide us. See you next time. Thanks, Julie. I just want to... Um, quickly just make an announcement. As, as you're inviting people to church, um, even though we don't have kids ministry classes going on on Sunday mornings right now, we're doing everything that we possibly can to keep our kids involved and families involved. So there's curriculum packets out in the commons that you can take home and do all of the lessons with the YouTube videos that are on our church YouTube page. And we've got activity packets and pages so that Kids can come here on Sunday mornings and worship as a family with you. So if you're inviting people, please let them know that that stuff, they can come and get it during the week. They can get it Sunday mornings. But we want to continue to be engaging our, our next generation as we're going through this pandemic as well. All right, we're going to continue to worship some, so I'm going to ask you to stand again with us. want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty. Great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. I want to be near, near to your heart, loving the praising him this morning the mountains shake before you 
the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell for any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great Put 
but all that is lost ever be found could a garden come up from this ground at all come on you know this
All the things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life.
ahead and have a seat. Nothing, just cleaning up a little. Well, welcome, welcome, everybody. I can honestly tell you that I am probably more excited that you're here than you are. So, because for the last year, I've been preaching to an empty church, and it is... Uh, it's not easy for me to preach to an empty church. I don't know if you guys enjoyed watching me online. I, I thought it was awful every single week. But let me tell you, it's just a different experience to be preaching to people. I can, I can see reaction. I can't see your smiles because of your masks. But I can see you nodding, and I can hear, well, maybe I'll hear you laugh at my stupid jokes today. So that's what I'm really excited about. Because there's just something about preaching to live people when you tell a joke and there's nobody to laugh even if it's just like one person, they go, oh, oh, oh. you know, then to get in your timing's all off. And so I'm just so excited that you're here. But while this is the first week that we're live here, this is not the first week we've been in this series called The Story of the Bible. In this series, we've been learning about how the Bible became the Bible. And if you've joined us over the last few weeks, you know that the Bible did not come to the world like this. How most of us got a Bible, right? Most of us got a Bible that was real, authentic, fake leather, right, on the outside, and it was all nice and put together, and all the books were numbered, and, the, and, and everything was just right. That's not how the Bible came into the world. It did not come down from on high like this. It was written over centuries and centuries, and it had many authors, and, and, and so, and it all started around the person of Jesus, and as the message of Jesus spread into the world, people started to learn about who this Jesus was and the way that he lived. And that meant that they got really interested in the religion that Jesus was born into. And, and that was Judaism. And Judaism had its own book. This is my version of the Jewish Bible. You'll notice that this one is smaller than this one. But that's just because I got the really tiny version. If you look at the words, they're like you got to have a magnifying glass to read this one. It's so small. But just like when Jesus was around, these scriptures were around. And so after Jesus died and people started to, to, to write accounts of Jesus' life, people didn't have a Bible to read. They didn't know, you know, what was going on. And, and so they picked up this book and they started to read it looking for information about who Jesus was and, and where Jesus came from. And what they found, it really surprised them because this was a world that believed in a pantheon of gods. This is a world that believed that every, basically everything was God, the sun, the wind, the, the rivers. They, they, they believed in, you know, multiple, multiple gods. But when they opened up this book, they found that the Hebrews had always only worshiped one God, Yahweh. And that the Hebrews believed that Yahweh was the creator of everything and created even humanity. It didn't create humanity to be a slave to, to Yahweh, but instead created humanity to, or sorry, it created humanity in the image of God. Thus, hold on, Matt, am I okay? 
It's got a ring. Is the mic on? Okay, so. Here, tell you what. Pause. This mic. All right. Can you hear me now? Not quite yet? Okay, we can hear me now. All right, this is better. Okay, so. If I had two hands, I can do this. So. But as they read this, they found out that they were created in the image of the creator. And that meant that every person had dignity. Every person was made in the image of God. And that's why in the law that was given at Mount Sinai, these laws, they were so different than other religious codes or moral codes of the times. In fact, if we look at the law that was given at Mount Sinai, the covenant, we find that the protections given by the Sinai covenant were for the time nothing short of revolutionary. It's interesting. So often when we look at the law, when we go back and we look at the law, we go, oh, it's outdated. It's hard to understand. Why would they do that? Why, why would God forbid them to eat, you know, whatever? Or why would God tell them that they can't wear this or that? Why would God tell them that they can't do that? But if you were to compare the law of Moses, the, the old covenant, with the laws of the surrounding countries and, and the surrounding peoples, you would find that it is hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ahead of its time. And the people that these protections were for, that, that, that the people that these laws were about, it would protect people that did not have protections in other places. And the people that were protected were the people that needed the most protections. The law at Mount Sinai, the covenant, by the standards of a day, it afforded protections to women, children, the poor, foreigners, in a time when those people would have had no rights at all. And in that way, this law was, again, way, way, way ahead of its time. But if you're counting, we've only made it through the first five books of the Bible of the Old Testament so far. And so, and I wanted to give you a big overview of the Old Testament. That's why this, today's sermon is called the Old Testament Part 2. We're going to try to get through most of the rest. Now, how many people know how many books are in the Old Testament? Off the top of your head, anybody? Anybody? This is like old school learning. Yeah? You were 34. You were here earlier, though. So. <laughs> so. But that's okay. Uh, there's 34 books in the Old Testament. We've made it through five. And, and uh, that brings us to this slide that we started last week. God the founder. After God the, created everything, God became a founder because God was finding a way to be in relationship with the people of the world. And, and so God you know, started with Abraham and then called Moses and now made a covenant at Mount Sinai. And, and we've talked a little bit about the law, and that's kind of where we ended last week. And so we're going to continue this week. But the law also wasn't just about what they could or could need. It wasn't just about what they should wear or not wear. Um, the covenant also gave the people a way to worship and to interact with God. And one of the big things that was set up in this covenant was what's called the sacrificial system. Now, the, 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 the extremely simplified version of this is that when you did something wrong, when someone did something wrong, they, the, there had to be a price paid for the wrong that was done. And in the law, the price had to be paid to both the person who the sin was against and God. And so if someone, let's say, killed your neighbor's chicken, you would have to replace the chicken, and then you would have to make some sort of sacrifice to God in order to cover the sin of killing the chicken. But... And so, depending on the sin, there were different levels of what you had to pay back, um, or different levels of what you had to sacrifice to make God happy. For the little things, you could go to God and maybe make a grain offering. You know, okay, God, I, I messed up. Here's some flour. And God would accept that. But for the big sins, for the, for the big wrongs that were done, an animal had to die. Blood had to cover the sin. And so, if, if you were poor, you would bring what you could bring. You maybe would bring a bird that you caught. If you were richer, a, a goat or even a cow 
would be required. And so you would bring these animals to a priest and they would kill it. They would offer it to God. And the blood would cover your sin. So moving forward in the story, the Israelite people, they had all these laws. They had learned to worship. They had turned into a people. But they had a problem. And their problem was they were like us. They liked to look around, especially at their neighbors. You know, we call it keeping up with the Joneses, right? The Joneses, they live down the street. We don't have anybody at this church with the last name Jones right now, so I can... I can kind of I can kind of pick on the Joneses, but the Joneses they live down the street, you know. And if we get a boat, they get a bigger boat. If we don't have a nice car, they just got a new car. Oh my gosh, we got to keep up with the Joneses. We're always looking to the Joneses to see what they've been doing. Well, the Israelites were the same way. They looked at their neighbors. They were seeing what their neighbors were doing, and they would come to God and say, "We want what they have." And one of the first things that they came to God with, they said. All the other countries, they have a king. We want a king. And so that should be our next slide. So we get to kings. Now, the good portion of the Hebrew Bible, it tells the histories of the kings of Israel. Now, we have to keep in mind that these stories that are being told, they're either being told by the king or historians that are telling the stories of what had happened. But the, the reality is that almost all of the kings that are in the, the Hebrew Bible were terrible kings, very, very bad kings. And, and they did not do what was good. They did not do what was right. They were just bad people. And honestly, this shouldn't surprise us. We're modern people. We know what happens when one person gets all the power, holds all the cards, right? They, they go, this is all about me. We've seen Game of Thrones, some of us, right? We know that people fight for power. And when people get power, they take it and they use that power against others. And that's exactly what would happen with the kings of Israel. The kicker to all of this, though, is that God did not want Israel to have a king at all. As a matter of fact, God had warned Israel about having a king generations before they ever had one. Way back when, when they were at Mount Sinai, God gave them this warning about what a king would do. God said in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God said, When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Notice, all the nations around us, they wanted, they were looking around. They wanted what the other nations have had. Then God tells them, be sure to appoint you over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. But then listen to these. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. Horses represented power. Egypt's great military might was in their chariots, not in their people, not in their weapons. And so horses represented military might. And God is saying, do not go that way again. The king, he continues, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Notice what God says a king should not do. He must not acquire great numbers of horses. He must not acquire the military might. He must not take many wives, and he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. If you read carefully the histories of the kings of Israel, guess ex what they do exactly? All of those things. And you would think maybe it takes a while. Maybe, you know, they start off good. No, 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 no. First king, Saul, he amasses armies. Second king, David, becomes incredibly wealthy. Third king, Solomon, marries like hundreds of wives and has hundreds of concubines. Three generations, all three of those things happen. And we wonder why six, seven, eight generations down the line, the kings aren't very good people. They were doing exactly what God had warned them not to do. 
and they got into trouble for it. Luckily, there was someone there, and we'll get to that here in a second, to speak against it. So, but first, it was under King Solomon that Israel also got something else that the other nations had. Again, they, they were looking to their neighbors, and the neighbors had something that, that Israel didn't have, and that was a temple. They got themselves a temple under Solomon. David wanted a temple, but God wouldn't let him build it. Solomon wanted to build a temple. Guess who didn't say they wanted a temple? God. God never said, build me a temple. Solomon said, let me build you a temple, and then God said, okay, if you're going to build one, here's how you do it. But what's interesting about the temple in Israel is that the temple in Israel looked very much like all the other temples in the ancient world. It was built kind of the same way. It was designed in the same way, except for one difference. The difference between the Israelite temple and every other temple is that if you went into what was called the God vault, and so the way that temples were built is they had a courtyard, and that's where the sacrifices were made because sacrifices were made with animals, and animals are smelly. And you build a fire inside, it gets smoky. Makes sense, right? And so all the, the, all the sacrifices were done outside. Inside, you would have a place where the, where the priests would work. This is where the priests would come and offer their gifts. But then you had what was called the God vault. The Israelites called it the Holy of Holies. This was the place where God lived. And so, in all the ancient Near East, in all these places that had temples, and every place you would walk into that place, and then there would be a picture, there would be an idol, there would be a description of whatever God belonged to the temple. But in Hebrew commandments, there was a command, you shall not make a graven image of me. God had told the Israelites, you shall not have an idol, you should not, because I am in everything, I am above everything. You cannot, know, like, there's not a graven image of me. So there wasn't a picture of a cow, or there wasn't a picture of a pole or an eagle, like a lot of other gods. There was nothing in there. In fact, in the year 67 BC, we all kind of know that around the time when Jesus lived, that, uh, that they were under the Roman occupation, right? There were Roman soldiers there we talked about all the Romans that are there. Well, it was 67 BC when the Roman Empire finally came to Judea and took Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem wasn't easy to take. It wasn't an easy fight back then. Jerusalem had a huge wall around the outside, see Nehemiah, but it also had an inner wall that surrounded the temple. And so, not only did they have to go through one wall, they had to go through two walls, and that second wall was up on a mountain. It was not an easy place militarily to take. And so General Pompey, around 67 BC, he goes and he starts to lay siege to Jerusalem. He finally, he gets some spies on the inside and they open the outer gates. And all the Israelite armies, they pour back, they fall back into the temple. And they fight to the last man to protect the temple of God, the temple of Yahweh. Pompey ended up slaughtering 1,200 Israelite soldiers on the Temple Mount. It's not that big of an area. And finally, he walked into the temple of this God that he had never even heard of. He says, I have to see this God. And so he walks back to the Holy of Holies where there's a big curtain, and he pulls it aside, and he steps in. You know what he saw? Some dishes, some silver and gold, a table. And he was so confused that he just turned around and he left. He could not understand why these people would live and die and worship a God that they could not see. Little did he know about 70 years later, this God would come to earth and that the Roman Empire would eventually end up seeing him. So, Imagine for a second, oh, sorry, get the page. So we have Abraham and Moses, we have the Mount Sinai Covenant, we have the kings, and we have the temple. And all this kind of makes sense, and, and we're kind of moving our way through the Old Testament, and, and then we get to the prophets. Now, a prophet was someone that spoke for God, 
but they played a very important part in society. You see, the king held all the power, right? They had, they, they, they had the military, they had the wealth, they had everything. The king was essentially the ruler, and no one could stop the king. But see, in Israel, the king was not the most powerful person. In Israel, God was the most powerful person. And the prophets spoke for God. And so when the kings would go astray, the prophets would come and would speak to them, and they would call them out, and, and, and they, would, they, they would have writings, and they would have speeches, and, and, and what they were trying to do was to guide the kings back to God. They were trying to guide, and so a prophet would speak at a specific time and a specific place and was really trying to speak out. But we have books. We did a whole series on the minor prophets last summer, and, and, and we have books and books and books of prophets in the Old Testament. And these prophets, they each came at a specific time to a specific king. Some of them were in the northern kingdom, some of them were in the southern kingdom. But they would always speak to the issues of the day. Except sometimes. Every once in a while, it wasn't often, but every once in a while a prophet would start to speak. And the people would start to listen and, and they would realize, he's not talking about me. He's not talking about us. And they would start to wonder, what in the world is this prophet talking about? And, and we know now that we live on the other side, right? On the other side of the prophets, we would know that, that these prophets, they were prophesying about the future, about something that would happen. There was a really good illustration of this in Isaiah chapter 53. And I want to read a couple of those verses to you now. Isaiah said these words. He said, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Leave it there for just a second. He was despised. Now, if you're reading this, and you go back to the beginning of the chapter, there is no explanation on who this is. There is just he. And if you think about, if you lived in Old Testament times and you were kind of listening to this, you'd be like, he, he... Who's the he he's talking about? I don't understand. Well, Isaiah continued, and he said, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, there's something you got to really understand about what's going on in Isaiah 53. Now, we know, right? We're Christians. We know who Isaiah is talking about, right? He's talking about Jesus. But during the time when Isaiah spoke these words, there was no Jesus. There was no Messiah. There was just he that Isaiah is talking about. 740 years before Jesus lived, Isaiah wrote about this man. And if you notice, Isaiah is living in, right, the temple times. He's living under the law. But this he would be pierced for our transgressions. What covered our transgressions under the sacrificial system? Animals, right? Animals had to die. He was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities is a fancy word for sin. And the punishment that brought us peace was on not animals, but him. And by his wounds we are healed. What is this that is happening in this time? And what is happening is Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus and how Jesus would do something new. How the whole sacrificial system would be changing. And how God would do something new. One more verse. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Notice he doesn't say, we, the nation of Israel, have gone astray. He says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now imagine for a second that at some point after the birth, life, and death of Jesus, after the resurrection, you know, it could be 50 years later, it could be 100 years later, it could be 500 years later, but you're Jewish, and so your parents, they teach you the history of your people. They teach you this book. 
right? And it has the law, and it has the prophets, and it has the writings. And, and so you, you, you read this whole thing, you learn about this whole thing. And then you get to Isaiah 53, and you have to be asking yourself, who is this he that Isaiah is talking about? What does this mean that our sins are laid upon him? We know that it's Jesus. But here's the kicker. Isaiah, he's writing this 740 years before Jesus walked this earth. And these are not, this isn't the only prophecy in the Old Testament. When the Gentiles started reading the Jewish Holy Scriptures, they found prophecy after prophecy, prophecy after prophecy about who the Messiah would be. It's a wonder they, that they were really interested in this book because they saw Jesus everywhere. But what I really want to pick up on in today's message is that we call this book our Old Testament, right? But this book is full of histories and life. The message is about the Jewish people and reminders of how they as a people had a special purpose. And that purpose, it goes all the way back to the Abrahamic promise that we spoke about last week. Abraham was promised by God that he would be blessed. But not just so that he would be blessed, but he would be blessed to be a blessing. And that through his family, every nation in the world would be blessed. This theme, it runs throughout the entirety of this book. Remember that Isaiah, it's one of the prophecies and it's towards the end. And that prophecy said that the entire world's sin, that the sin of us all was going to be put on this one man. Through Jesus, the world would be blessed. Through Jesus, it became not about Jewish people, but about all people. Through Jesus, through Jesus we see the climax of this story. And a story it is. And it's a beautiful story. And it's a gritty story. There's blood. There's sex. There's violence in this story. As a matter of fact, when people start to read this book, a lot of times they like to turn away. But the Hebrew Bible is the story of God interacting with humanity. And it can be sum summarized in this way. It can be summarized that God waded into the fray and played by the rules of the kingdoms of the world in order to usher in a kingdom not of this world. Why does God do it this way? Because God always speaks to us at our capacity. God always teaches us at our capacity what we're ready for. It's kind of like when a five-year-old asks you, where do babies come from? You don't tell them the same answer that you would tell a 16-year-old right? And you don't tell the 16-year-old the same answer that you would tell a med student, do you? We always speak to the capacity of the person that we're talking to. In the same way, God speaks to us at our capacity. We may look at what's going on in the Old Testament and go, ooh, that's hard, but God waded into history. And the history of the Old Testament people, the Hebrew Bible, it's a saga. It's a saga where, of an ancient people that are struggling to survive in a world where food was scarce, where enemies were real, and where death was just a minor infection away. But in spite of that, they clung to Yahweh. They, this people, they, they, they clung to their God. And God, in turn, clung to the nation, careful not to override their freedom with his own presence. The entire story, it's gritty. It's powerful. But I want to remind you that it's history with a divine purpose. It's leading somewhere. And the place where it's leading is the person of Jesus. And the divine purpose is you. And you. And you, unless you are Jewish, you are not a member of God's people until Jesus comes for the entire world. We're Gentiles, just like the people who originally picked up this book. And so they started calling this book the Old Testament, or actually they called it the Old Covenant. 
because they recognized the power the, the old covenant had, but they also recognized that Jesus was doing a new thing, that Jesus had done a new thing, and that Jesus had established a new covenant. And so they had their new covenant, but they recognized this as the old covenant. Eventually, old covenant got translated into Latin and became Old Testament. That's where we get that. It's the Latin word for covenant. And so, we have the old, we have, and at this point in history, we have Gentiles that are reading this book. And they maybe have an account of Jesus' life. But what they don't have is a Bible. Not yet. They maybe have an account, and they're just starting to get some letters. And these letters, they come from a really famous church planter who's writing to all the churches he's planted all around the Mediterranean Rim. And that's where we're going to pick up the story next week in the story of the Bible. So I got three questions for you to go home with and, and to take home. Question number one is, how is reading the Old Testament as a historical record of the Hebrew people different than reading it as a spiritual guidebook? Question number two, if the Old Testament covenant was for the Hebrew people and the covenant of Jesus for all people, does this change, challenge, or reinforce your view of the Bible and or God? Then number three, we talked about the theme of Israel being chosen by God to bless the world from the time of Abraham to Jesus. How does this make you feel about God, the God of the Old Testament, who is the same God as the New Testament? And about Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, right now I pray for all of us. I pray for each of us that are here, all of us that are at home. I pray that as we learn more about the story of the Bible, that God, it would encourage us. It would encourage us to go and to refocus our efforts on knowing more about where the Bible came from, but God, also how the Bible affects us. God, let us never lose sight of what is truly important. Let us never take our eyes off of Jesus. Because it's because of Jesus that all of this came to be one book. And so, God, let us not forget how that story affects each and every one of us. And, and let us hold on to the hope. Let us hold on to the grace. Let us hold on to the peace that comes and following you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Will you stand again? I searched the world But it couldn't fill me praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's no
a little bit longer than we wanted to this morning, so thanks for hanging with us. Um, thanks for everybody at home that's joining in. It's been so wonderful to be able to hear people singing back and see some of your faces. <laughs> um, I just, I hope that it's been a great experience for you and that we can see you next time. God bless. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. And Lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't faced by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care.